she vanished without a trace. This was a terrible mystery. She absolutely disappeared. They knew a killer was on the loose. His haunts were college campuses. I think everybody's scared all the time. But they didn't know how to catch him. They were basically running down leads that led to nowhere. You got bones, you don't know anything more. The evidence is gone. See how law enforcement tracked down the infamous Ted Bundy. One of the worst sex murderers of all time. And exposed his deranged acts to the world. It was extremely wicked, shockingly evil. He's very much the poster boy for the charming serial killer. She stopped struggling and stopped screaming. I don't want to think that Ted Bundy got her. July 14th, 1974, was a beautiful Sunday afternoon. It was 90 degrees in Seattle, and we don't get that many 90-degree days. Everybody was at Lake Sammamish State Park. Everybody, including a dark-haired man with one arm in a sling. Pretending to need assistance, he asked a young woman to help him get his sailboat onto his car. The girl that was first approached actually went to the car and was the only person to see the vehicle and noticed that there was no sailboat there and said, oh, I thought it was here. And he said, no, it's at my parents' house up on the hill in Issaquah. Well, she didn't go with him. But the man kept trying. Janice Ott lived in Issaquah, a little town not that far away, and she bicycled to the park. And she was his type. When she got up to go with him, she stuck out her hand and she said, hi, I'm Jan, and he said, oh, I'm Ted. And so that's the last time anybody saw Jan Ott. About three hours later, Denise Naslin disappears. She was there with her boyfriend, her dog, another couple. She left uh, with a dog to go to the bathroom. The dog came back, but she didn't. There were thousands and thousands of girls at Lake Sammamish. Why did you choose her? In the space of a few hours, two girls had completely disappeared. Investigators canvassed everyone who had been at the park. It was kind of surprising that he would have chosen such a crowded area. There was a lot of people there that could have seen him and it Eventually, we found a lot of people who had been approached by this man. There were a dozen witnesses, young women, whom he had approached with his story about his boat on his car and his broken arm. Police got a major clue from their interviews. One witness heard the man introduce himself as Ted. Investigators were also able to put together a composite sketch of the suspect for the public. As the hunt for Ted began, more girls, mostly college-aged, were also missing from the area. They all vanished without a trace. These were very publicized missing people in their various jurisdictions. Not just in Seattle, but from Oregon State University, Central Washington, Evergreen, down in Olympia. It became very difficult to link these cases together. There may or may not be communication between the police agencies. I mean, nowadays, we are very fortunate. National databases have made a significant difference in how these types of crimes, uh, crimes that occur across state lines, get handled. But once police made the possible connection, panic gripped the region. There was a great deal of fear, a great deal of concern. We started a service on campus where women could be walked back to their dorms. This was a terrible mystery. I mean, how could these girls suddenly just disappear? One girl was walking like 30 feet from the back of her sorority to another sorority, and boom, she's gone. How could this happen? All these kids were 19, 20 years old. They had the world by the tail. They had the future. And uh, how many families were left in just total tragedy and disarray? Almost two months after the Lake Sammamish disappearances, police solved one of the mysteries what had happened to Denise Nasland and Janice Ott. 
a hunter found what appeared to be human bones on a hillside about a mile from the lake. The bones were spread out throughout this hillside, and they were spread out by animals. But that's all it was, was just bones. It wasn't, there wasn't bodies or anything. They found bones and hair from Denise, Janice, and at least one other woman at the site. But police would not identify who she was for many years. We were fortunate to have Explore Search and Rescue that assisted us with the crime scene processing. They were actually on their hands and knees, crawling shoulder to shoulder, going through all of the brush and stuff with their fingers to find bones. You need a number of people to go through a scene, shoulder to shoulder, so that all evidence is collected. Remember that the bodies found at the crime scene uh, are only one piece of the puzzle. There was nothing like this ever found in the history of King County. But police found another site like it all too quickly. The following year, in March of 75, we found four people who were missing, but we only found skull parts there. We never found one other bone, which is real unusual. We found animal bones, so we knew we were searching good enough to find bones, but we didn't find a human bone other than just skull parts. The skulls found at Taylor Mountain gave them a grisly clue. They appeared to have decomposed at the same rate. In other words, you had girls basically that were missing in January, April, two in May. But the leaf fall, the growth of fine maple over the tops of them, all kind of had the same look to them. That wouldn't have happened if they were dumped at different times. It could lead to the conclusion that these individuals were killed and their bodies maintained in a particular place, uh, kind of stored up. Uh, and then when the perpetrator felt comfortable enough to move these skulls to a particular place, that's what happened. Investigators got an important lead from Taylor Mountain. One of the skulls came from Susan Rancourt, who had disappeared from Central Washington State College in Ellensburg, 120 miles away. Police found two other women there who had been approached by a strange man. His arm was bandaged, and he asked the girls to help carry his books to his car, a Volkswagen Beetle. They went to his car, but then got frightened. I talked to one, and she said, when I got there, I saw that the passenger seat of the Volkswagen was gone, and I just felt dread. I dropped his books and ran. But those are the ones who survived. We know from the Rancourt case that she did suffer a skull fracture. So she was hit by uh, a tire iron. We do know that from looking at her skull. But that's all we know what happened to these women. I mean, you got bones, you, know, you don't know anything more. Without crime scene evidence, police tried to prioritize their leads from the hundreds of calls that came into their hotline. They tracked people who owned Volkswagens, people who had known the victims, and others. There were so many lists that they came up with the then revolutionary idea of entering them into a computer and seeing how many matches they could find. Computers in general have really uh, advanced the cause of criminal justice as it has many other fields. Computers can actually look at different databases and establish how many people in the population are named Ted that have Volkswagens. But as the police investigation of the killings hit full swing, the abductions suddenly stopped. Everything stopped virtually in July of 74. We didn't find any more, there weren't any more people who were missing. Then, in October, in a suburb of Salt Lake City, hundreds of miles away, 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox stepped outside her house. She was never seen again. I knew that she didn't run away because she had a brand new coat this was an October night. Um, she had some beautiful turquoise jewelry. She didn't take that. She didn't take any money. She absolutely disappeared. Just as the Seattle police suspected, the killer had moved on. He left in September and he moved to Utah. 
He was there just a short time and women started to disappear. Melissa Smith, I believe it was October 14th. Then Laura Amy disappeared on Halloween. Debbie Kent disappeared from Bountiful, Utah. We were at the play at Beaumont with her. My husband, myself, and Deborah went to the play. She thought it was such a good place, she wanted us to go. It ran overtime, and our youngest son was at the roller skating rink skating, and he needed to be picked up. So at 10.15, she left Beaumont High to go to the roller skating rink to pick him up so that he wouldn't be left stranded. And that was the last we saw her. That very night, I knew something was really wrong. Sue Curtis was at Brigham Young University in June 1975. She was there attending a youth conference with another group of kids from the Salt Lake area and uh, was walking back to her dorm room uh, on a Saturday evening and vanished without a trace. Girls were missing from Colorado as well. Ski instructor Julie Cunningham and nurse Karen Campbell, who disappeared from the Aspen Hotel where she was staying with her fiance. No one knew about how to investigate these cases. Uh, no one knew what to expect. And here you end up with a guy who travels across state lines. He was unusually mobile serial killer where he didn't have any trouble crossing county lines, state lines, and going across the country. He's very rare. I mean, when you look at serial killers today, most of them are geographically restricted. They're, they're in the haunts where they like to be. Well, his haunts were college campuses. In some of the new cases, bodies were found more quickly than in Seattle. Authorities could tell that the killer had molested the victims. One girl had on makeup she had never worn in life, so police suspected the killer was visiting the bodies after death. Then, on August 16, 1975, more than a year after the Seattle murders began, police in Utah pulled over a suspicious driver. He was driving at night, the early morning hours, and was spotted by a Utah State Trooper going home after shift. And of course, Bundy was driving his Volkswagen Bug without the lights on. Where he's caught with the lights out, I'm thinking that he's trolling for victims and trying to see if he could find someone without anyone knowing he was close to them and got caught. A search of Ted Bundy's car confirmed the officer's suspicions. The trooper found this bag. And in the bag was a crowbar, handcuffs, an awl or an ice pick, pantyhose ski mask, a regular ski mask, strips of leather, flashlight, garbage bags. And Bundy said, well, th these are what everybody carries in their Volkswagen bug. But obviously, uh, those were his murder implements. So he carried his own chamber of horrors around with him. The clean-cut Bundy was a law student at the University of Utah who had gone to college in Seattle. After he was arrested, we were shocked. We couldn't believe it. Uh, we tried to raise money for a defense fund for him and, and tried to protect him. We couldn't believe it. They had to have the wrong guy. Bundy had been a political volunteer when he was in Seattle. The Ted Bundy we knew before there were any accusations, any charges, any arrests or anything, was a very nice guy. He was a person that we socialized with and uh, we knew a little bit professionally. And, and um, I thought was really an up and comer. Somebody was going to do well in life. He made a very positive impression. He was very verbal, articulate, intelligent. He dressed extremely well, uh, very much uh, different than the average student of that era. He looked like a young Cary Grant. Bundy was a very smooth, very well-educated, uh, very deceptive type individual. He was the type of person that uh, anyone would say that no, it would be impossible for him to be involved in anything such as this. When he was released on bail, Bundy tried to cover his tracks by cleaning out his VW. But it turned out he left evidence behind. There was some hair that was found in Bundy's car uh, that matched uh, both Amy and Smith. In Bundy's apartment, authorities found a brochure for the Aspen, Colorado Hotel, 
where Karen Campbell was last seen before disappearing. Through tracing his gasoline uh, credit cards, uh, some of the areas that we placed him in that particular area, there was also hair samples that was found in Bundy's car that was consistent with the victim in Colorado. I begin to think either Ted is guilty or he's the unluckiest man there ever was because every place he's been, the a beautiful young woman fitting the same profile disappears or is found murdered. And I asked him that when I visited him, and he said, Ann, it's not against the law to be in Colorado. Yeah, they have my credit cards were used to buy gas on the same day in the same towns where those girls disappeared, but it's not against the law to be in Colorado. The most damaging evidence against Bundy would be witnesses. For the first time, people picked him out in a lineup. He was identified by a school teacher from the high school where Debbie Cann had been attending a play. Uh, he was identified by Carol DeRanch, the girl who got away from him. Carol DeRanch was the witness police had been waiting for. Bundy had approached her claiming to be a police detective. He asked her to go with him to help with a case. When she got into his Volkswagen, he tried to handcuff her. She fought him and got away. For the first time, here we have a living victim that's able to describe her abductor, describe the car, and also provide evidence with the handcuff that was still on her wrist and to know that this guy was a good-looking guy who she thought it was OK to go with. Bundy went to trial for attempted kidnapping in February 1976, and Durant's testimony sank him. He was convicted and extradited to Colorado to stand trial for the murder of Karen Campbell. He decided this time he would defend himself. My class is graduating in about a month. Uh, I'll, I'll bet you I'm more about love than you, any of them. Bundy gave a jailhouse television interview to bring his case to the public. Why did you decide to defend yourself? I felt it was right. I wanted to get involved. I wanted to become a part of my defense because I am such a part of it. I mean, I, I, obviously, I'm going to bear the consequences, so why not bear the responsibility? Do you get fresh air, son? Do you get out? No. Well, I get to go to the library. <laughs> it's a 50-yard walk from here across, this, across the parking lot to the library, and that's my fresh air. Those trips to the library gave Bundy the chance to make a daring escape. In July 1977, he jumped out a second story window and got away. He had every right actually to be in the law library if he was helping with his case and because he was a law student and in particular when he was representing himself. So he had every right to do that. Now, uh, why would somebody leave a window open? Well, nobody's thinking like a predator. He's thinking like a predator, and he's looking for every which way he can to elude law enforcement. Authorities caught him a week later, but in December, just before the new year, Bundy tried again. He went through the top of his cell, down through the jailer's apartment, out into a blizzard in, uh, in Colorado, stole an old beater of a car that gave out on the pass, headed for Denver, got a ride. He had money. When he wrote to us from the jail cell in Colorado and was afraid he wouldn't get a fair trial, um, all of us chipped in money to get a, get a public survey done. And the great question that lingers in my mind is, did he use our money to get to Florida? If he did, then we have blood in our hands, too because more murders occurred shortly after that. Law enforcement people have lost all track of Bundy. He escaped from a Colorado prison on New Year's Eve. And now, he is one of the FBI's most wanted men. In December 1977, accused killer Ted Bundy escaped from a small jail in Aspen, Colorado, and eventually made his way to Tallahassee, Florida. He found a room at a boarding house near the Florida State University campus. When he was here, he lived by stealing. He used credit cards that belonged to other people. He used cash he stole from other people. He, he stole bicycles. He stole cars. About a week after he arrived in Florida, Bundy picked up where he had left off out west. Investigators believe he focused on Cheryl Thomas, who lived near campus. 
she definitely fit the profile of the other girls that he uh, is suspected of killing. She was out that night. He waited for her. She didn't come home. And he got frustrated. And as best we could piece it together, he left there, then saw some women entering the Chi Omega house. The door downstairs, the lock didn't work. So all he had to do was slip in there, and he had on a watch cap uh, and the high neck cat burglar outfit and the oak club. He crept up the back stairs and attacked four of the girls sleeping. I think he went in that house to kill every single woman in it. He first went to the room of Margaret Bowman. Her major was art history, so she wanted to be um, the curator at a museum. And that would have fit Margaret to a T. I mean, I really could have seen her in that role. Um, Lisa was um, a very vivacious, bubbly kind of person. Lisa Levy's room was near the one Karen Chandler shared with Kathy Kleiner. I quit what I was doing and just sat in bed and watched TV for probably half an hour and then turned off the lights and went to bed. Both Karen and Kathy were severely beaten, but they survived. Margaret Bowman and Lisa Levy were raped and killed. Another sorority sister, Nita Neary, came home from her date around 3 a.m. As she was coming into the foyer area of the Kyle Mega House, she noticed a man coming down the stairway carrying a wooden club. And she was able to get a profile view of that individual. As the man came down the stairway, he immediately exited through the front door that was adjacent to the stairway. Neary called the police. We had received the telephone call about 3.23 that night. Uh, our units were in the, on the scene at 3.26. The best way to describe the, the actual homicide scenes was it looked like a shark frenzy. As the police investigated the horrific murder site, Bundy made his way back to Cheryl Thomas's house. He entered that house. Again, did the same thing. He bludgeoned her. While he was doing that, her neighbors heard the sounds. 911 emergency. Law enforcement arrived on the scene to find yet a fifth victim. Again, a victim that had been beaten uh, around the head. In one night, Ted Bundy killed two young women and left three more for dead. This brutal rampage in some ways seemed different from his more controlled pattern in the West. It was definitely a rage event, uh, not a calculated plan something. This was almost a, a frenzy, uh, which was uh, not characteristic of Bundy, which would suggest that Bundy might be becoming a little unglued. Unlike the murders out west, these attacks were committed inside, which meant evidence could be recovered more easily. To attack five women in one night and leave two bodies inside where other women are there and alive and awake, and the police are coming right now, that's pretty careless. The vicious murders made national news, and they caught the attention of some of Bundy's longtime pursuers. We'd gotten two phone calls the morning of the murders. Uh, one from Bob Keppel. He told us to look for somebody named Ted Bundy. He hit people while they were asleep in their bed with some sort of a piece of wood or tire iron or something. And that was the same thing he did up in Washington State. But Bundy was only one suspect in a case that seemed to overwhelm the local authorities. We've got a very disturbed sick individual. They were basically running down leads that led to nowhere. All of a sudden, we had two women dead, three left for dead uh, in a panicked campus. It was a real loss of innocence for this community. I think everybody's scared all the time. I'm even just walking to classes. As the community and the police struggled to grasp what had happened, Bundy took off. He had left Tallahassee. It really got a little bit hot for him here. Ted Bundy stole a van from the university and headed north. We know that he was in Jacksonville on the afternoon of February the 8th. He stayed over that night in Lake City and then picked up Kimberly the next day. 
Kimberly Leach was a 12-year-old junior high school student. She had been elected uh, runner-up uh, to the queen of the Valentine's dance. She seemed popular with her classmates, just an ordinary 12-year-old junior high school student. That made her much younger than Ted Bundy's other victims. He's seeing her simply as a victim of opportunity, somebody, because he needs something now, he needs his fix, it's like an addiction now. And he's not thinking as carefully as he had been early in his murdering career. He may have used an approach similar to the one he used with Carol Durange, who escaped his grasp in Utah. We did have a witness who observed Bundy leaving the junior high school in Lake City with Kimberly Leach. She appeared to be distressed. Bundy was leading her to the van, and we believe that Bundy had indicated that he needed her to go with him uh, because there was some type of family emergency. Bundy drives a distance of about 40 miles from Lake City Junior High School to an area near the Swanee River State Park. It would be weeks before police found Kim Leach's body. But Ted Bundy actually brought the crime scene to the authorities. After he killed her, came back, dumped the van next to the FSU campus. It was observed by some FSU officers in routine patrol that it was a, it was a hot van. Our uh, chief investigator, a guy named Steve Hooker, uh, looked inside and said, something's happened here, and we need to go ahead and preserve this as a crime scene. We did. Uh, we took it the next day to the, the FDLE laboratory here in Tallahassee and were able to process it and ultimately get a lot of the evidence that we were able to use. Once he dumped the van, Bundy stole a car he was more comfortable with a Volkswagen Beetle. He was actually arrested uh, driving a Volkswagen in Pensacola several days after the abduction and murder of Kimberly Leach. He stopped in an alleyway. Uh, a Pensacola police officer saw him, approached the car, I think he'd run the tag, found out it was a stolen tag. Ted tried to flee on him on his foot. Well, initially, when I was putting, placing the handcuffs on him, he kicked my feet out from under me and struck me with uh, a handcuff that had been placed on one wrist. And of course, knocked me off my feet, and uh, that's when it started. There was a struggle. There was actually a round fire, and the officer was able to bring Ted into custody. At first, Bundy used a fake name from a university ID he had stolen, but the police quickly learned who they had in custody. Two investigators, one from the sheriff's department and one from the Tallahassee Police Department, went over there. Uh, during that period of time, he admitted that his name was Theodore Robert Bundy, and he had by that time also been in, uh, added to the FBI's most wanted list. I understand that possibly 25 uh, different law enforcement agencies throughout the United States who are interested in questioning him about various offenses. The infamous Ted Bundy had been caught again, but not before he killed three more people and critically wounded three others. To try to beat the cases against him, Bundy would play to the cameras. He said he was going to get it. Okay, you've got the indictment. It's all you're going to get. Pensacola, Florida police are questioning a man they say may be one of the worst sex murderers of all time. On February 15, 1978, Ted Bundy was arrested in Pensacola, Florida. He was quickly transferred to Tallahassee, where two young women had been murdered at the Chi Omega sorority. It was very much a relief to have someone locked up for these offenses. And there was enough in the media about the type of evidence available, the history of Mr. Bundy, that kind of solidified everybody's opinions against him. He was charged with a number of forgeries and auto thefts that had occurred here in Tallahassee. We were processing the charges against him as a method of holding him here in Tallahassee while the murder investigation was continuing. Theodore Robert Bundy, you are charged two counts murder in the first degree, three counts attempted murder in the first degree. I'll plead not guilty right now. The authorities in Florida were determined to try Bundy themselves rather than send him back to the Northwest to be tried for the string of murders there. We had the better evidence. Most of their victims were after-the-fact crime scenes. 
virtually all of them, you had a body that had been deteriorated if you even had the body. We had a fresh crime scene. Quite frankly, I informed them that possession was nine-tenths of the law, and since we had possession of Mr. Bundy, we had no intention of releasing him to Colorado, where he'd already escaped twice. As they prepared the case against him, prosecutors had to face Ted Bundy, the would-be lawyer. My name's Ted Bundy, and I'm the defendant in the case. He argued motions to the court. He took depositions of witnesses. Uh, he filed his own motions. The fact that he continued to try and represent himself and exert strong influence over more skilled attorneys, I think, points to part of that, that ego gratification he was getting from that, just as he got ego gratification from the murders and controlling his victims. I always said that infamy became Ted. There was something about the strobe lights and the cameras on him, and he was great on camera. You're going to represent yourself, or you're going to get another attorney? I'm staying with the man I know best right now, and that's me. Bundy's performance as lawyer came at his own expense. Part of the theme of the defense was that he was a victim of this overzealous police effort. And it's very difficult to be seen as a victim of that if you're clever enough to be your own lawyer. The first trial in the Chi Omega killings opened in the summer of 1979 in Miami. Despite Bundy's reputation, the prosecutors had their work cut out for them. This case was not a slam dunk. This was a circumstantial evidence case. There were some key pieces of evidence, but all of it together is what allowed us to obtain a conviction. Nita Neary from the Chi Omega sorority provided the main witness identification. Would you point out the man that you saw at the door of the Chi Omega house? Let the record reflect that she has identified the man. <laughs> At Cheryl Thomas's house, the attacker had left a mask. Within that pantyhose mask were two uh, Caucasian uh, head hairs. Those hairs were determined by the laboratory to be consistent with the hair of Theodore Robert Bundy. In the early days of forensic science, in the, in the 70s, hair evidence was not as powerful as it is today. You really couldn't say to a degree of scientific certainty that this individual was the source of this particular hair. You could say it was consistent with having a common origin. Nowadays, we can do mitochondrial DNA analysis on a hair shaft. Another piece of evidence was bite marks on the body of one of the victims. There was a bite mark that was left on the buttock of one of the Kyle Mega homicide victims. We secured a search warrant from the uh, local state court judge to actually search Mr. Bundy's mouth to obtain uh, impressions of his teeth that could then later be used to compare against the bite mark. They have taken my teeth and twisted them every which way but loose to fit. The evidence was controversial. I thought it was totally bogus. If someone bites part way into a piece of cheese, you can measure distances and see anomalies in their teeth. When you bite into human skin, it moves. It distorts, it bruises, and uh, you can't really accurately measure it. In the Bundy case, those impressions were very clear, and he did it twice. He made two clear bites in the same place on on very fleshy area of the body, and they were very clear. They took the impressions of his teeth and were able to show from the transparency that they made of his teeth placed against those bite marks. The it was just just perfect but perhaps the most damaging moment in the trial came courtesy of Bundy himself when he decided to cross-examine an officer who was one of the first at the crime scene I was supposed to cross-examine that officer Ted stands up and takes a file from my hand he asks a few perfunctory questions the first victim you saw was Kathy Kleiner yes, and then asked him to please state with great detail what you saw when you pulled back those sheets. And there was no human being in that building or watching the TV at that time that could have thought anything other than this man wanted to relive that event. And this was the second day of the trial. The trial, for all practical purposes, was over. It had nothing to do with bite marks. It had nothing to do with hair. It had nothing to do with anything. 
It was that question that sealed his fate. We, the jury, at Miami Dade County, Florida, find the defendant, Theodore Robert Bundy, guilty as charged. On July 31st, 1979, Judge Edward Coward delivered his sentence. It is this court's reasoned judgment. You, Theodore Robert Bundy, be adjudicated guilty of murder in the first degree, and that you be put to death by a current of electricity, and such current of electricity shall continue to pass through your body until you are dead. Now that Ted Bundy had been sentenced to die for two murders, he went to trial again for kidnapping and killing 12-year-old Kimberly Leach. We had strong, strong evidence in the Lake City case. We had a lot of scientific evidence, particularly hairs and fibers, that we were able to connect Kimberly to Ted and to that van at the same time. The van really provided most of the physical evidence that we used to convict Bundy. We were able to tie through uh, fiber transfers Kimberly Leach to the van, to the carpet in the van. We were able to place Bundy in the van through fiber transfers. We also had some semen stains on Kim Leach's underwear that uh, matched the blood type of Bundy. This was back before DNA evidence. One could determine if the evidence uh, was uh, derived from a person who was type A, B, AB, or O. Unfortunately, half the population have the same type. Nowadays, we're astonished that we put so much reliability into that determination. The reality is DNA has completely replaced uh, ABO typing. Uh, and it, nowadays, we would have been able to look at a semen stain or a blood stain and said absolutely certainly. But even in 1980, the case against Bundy was strong enough to convict him. The court finds this kidnapping and murder was indeed heinous, atrocious, and cruel in that it was extremely wicked, shockingly evil, vile, and with utter indifference to human life. Once again, Ted Bundy was sentenced to die in the electric chair, but he would keep fighting to save his own neck. It was a desperate ploy. Do you ever think about the possibility of facing a firing squad? I think I stand about as much chance of dying in front of a firing squad or in a gas chamber as you do being killed on a plane flight home. Let's hope you don't. <laughs> but so you don't lie awake at night thinking about it? Not a moment. Honest to God, not a moment. Because it's not going to happen. After nine years on Florida's death row and a series of unsuccessful appeals, Ted Bundy faced execution in January 1989. The rendezvous with electric chair will be on next Tuesday at 7 o'clock in the morning. Bundy decided he would try one last ploy. He knew there were investigators still trying to find bodies he had buried and families who still wanted to know whether he was the one. Connie Wilcox, whose daughter Nancy disappeared from her suburban Utah neighborhood in 1974, thought about writing a letter. I would... Um address it to Mr. Ted Bundy, and I, I would write it in a very uh, professional way, and I would ask him if he killed my daughter. I don't want to think that Ted Bundy got her, but I don't know. I just don't know what could have happened to her. The parents of these, of these girls, I really feel for them because apparently they suffered some uh, an incredible tragedy in their lives. The loss of a loved one is is probably probably the most extreme kind of loss you can suffer in, in this life. And I say, I, I feel as much for them as anybody can. Bundy tried to bargain. He'd give information, but he wanted a state prosecutor's office to ask for a stay of the execution so he had time to tell his stories. The offer was controversial. I had one set of parents calling me, uh, urging me to urge the governor of Florida to have him executed immediately. I had another set of parents calling, saying, please, we have to know what happened to our daughter. Now, all of a sudden, he wants to tell the truth. We are not considering that request. For him to be negotiating for his life over the bodies of victims is despicable. Nonetheless, police from several states gathered in Florida to meet with Bundy, including Bob Keppel 
the first detective assigned to the case. He had uh, never admitted in the first person that he'd ever murdered anybody to anyone. He did it with George Ann Hawkins. He chose that one because it was a chance, he thought, for us to be able to find some bones and confirm that she was uh, a possible victim. Bundy said he had killed Hawkins in Issaquah, Washington. It turned out she was one of the first victims found in 1974, but her bones had never been identified. He described the Issaquah crime scene to me, and it was almost like he was just there. I mean, he didn't miss a bend in the road. Right then, the minute he described that site, I knew that that was it. He was the one. Bundy told many of his stories in the third person. I'm not thinking clearly, but still intending not to harm her. Uh, he placed his hands around her throat just to throttle her into unconsciousness so that she wouldn't scream anymore. She stopped struggling and stopped, uh, stopped screaming. On his last night, Ted Bundy confessed to dozens of murders, including that of Nancy Wilcox, whose mother had waited for word. This was like a new death for me. He also admitted to some killings that no one had ever connected to him. He added two from Idaho that I didn't even know about. Bundy had said that he had killed 30 women in various states. They were not able to find all those bodies, so they don't know that that's true. Some people say he killed a lot more than 30, but we really don't know how many he committed, though he was able to close a few cases that they had not been able to close before. The confessions did not delay Bundy's execution, which went forward on January 24, 1989. Hundreds of people gathered to bear witness. I'm saying that he ought to die. I have a daughter that lives in Lake City, and I want him gone. Theodore Bundy was executed at 716 this morning in the electric chair at Florida State Prison. He was executed for the murder of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach of Lake City, Florida. Almost 20 years after his execution and more than 30 years after he began his killing spree, Ted Bundy still fascinates. He's probably the most renowned serial killer in the world, aside from Jack the Ripper, because he was so photogenic, handsome, smart, willing to talk, articulate, defended himself, that he's very much the poster boy for how the charming serial killer fooled so many people. His crimes are studied by investigators and by would-be protégés. Because of all the media generated by him, a number of people who aspire to become serial killers often want that kind of glamour, too. He's definitely a premier serial killer. He is probably the model, uh, but I don't think there's very many of them like him, fortunately. Ted Bundy's crimes will continue to haunt those who hunted him and those whose loved ones he hunted.